Hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. Today we are going to cover the immune system in lecture. The immune system and the lymphatic system are kind of um, connected, you know, so we did the lymphatic system in lab, but we also mentioned during the lymphatic system in our lab, you know, things like lymph nodes and how there's B cells in there that activate immunity, create to start to create antibodies. And so this chapter we're going to look more specifically at the immune side of things instead of the lymphatic side of things. So first off let's start and let's take a look at this basic immunity. So immune system protects us from infectious agents and harmful substances. Let's take a note infectious agents. You know we don't tend to call them infectious agents. A lot of times we call them pathogens. So I definitely want you to take that term down a pathogen. Pathogen is a type of infectious agent. There's mainly many different types of infectious agents here. It's kind of talking about it just a little bit. So again, these are pathogenic or they can generate disease, right? These infectious agents. Five big groups that we may discuss, and we mainly talk about the first two. So usually whenever we're discussing immunity in our chapter, these are usually the main two that we talk about, bacteria and viruses. These are the main two infections that we tend to think about. We can have a fungal infection as well. So fungus, their spores. A protozoan infection, if you drink water out of a stream that might have, uh, you know, runoff from farm animals, then you might get some kind of weird protozoan in that water and you drink it and then it's totally going to screw up your intestines, right? So those protozoans are single-celled organisms that proto before zoa animals. So these are single-celled organisms that uh, kind of acquired, evolved the traits that animals kind of demonstrate on a bigger level. And then we have things like multicellular parasites. And these are not quite as common in humans, but things like worms, you know, um, flukes. We don't hear about those very often, but worms, you know, a tapeworm, some kind of worm you might see in your dog, for example. So those are pathogens or infectious agents. The other thing it mentions over here that the immune system helps to protect against are harmful substances. And I Want you to put a term for that as well. A harmful substance most of the time in our body we tend to call it a toxin. So harmful substances or toxins in our body this is something else that you know our immune system can identify and it can help to start triggering an immune response. So our immune system is composed of many different components, cellular, molecular components. They function together to provide our immunity. We don't we need all of them. It's not like we can just get rid of one or two and still function properly. We need this redundancy. We need this backup for our backup for our backup kind of concept, right? And so our response is going to be different depending on what the problem is, what the pathogen we're facing. Um, but overall anything that will work we want to throw it at that problem in case you know it all needs to work together and so we do have a lot of redundancy as I mentioned here are the infectious agents we like to call them pathogens I like to I don't like to call them infectious agents these first four especially I refer to them a lot of times as MOs big M big O little s MO stands for microorganisms. So a lot of times you may hear me talk about MOs, and an MO is a microorganism, something small we can't see that can cause disease. Leukocytes, very important whenever we look at cells in the immune system. When we look at the immune system, these are kind of the primary cells of the immune system, our white blood cells. Remember, these guys are mainly formed in red bone marrow, but we're going to find out that we can grow some of these. We can kind of reproduce some of these in other lymph organs. So things like lymph nodes, we can create more white blood cells. Um, and that's what happens whenever we have um, a swollen lymph node is that we have created more B cells in there, and now they're creating more antibody to help protect our body against whatever that pathogen might be. Now again, we've talked about this in the past. I don't care if you know your granulocytes versus your agranulocytes, but there's five flavors of whites, and we've mentioned these before. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. Let's talk about these in a little bit more detail. Um, but we will talk about these in a little bit more detail. But let's go ahead and let's hit some basics about these, and let's kind of remind what we talked about um, when we were in the um, – previous chapter dealing with blood. And so here are our fives. Don't forget neutrophils. These are the microphages. These are the first line of inner defense. Once something gets through our skin or our membranes, this is the first thing that comes and attacks it. Um, and they especially like to eat bacteria. Eosinophils. These guys um, can help to downregulate inflammation. They can help eat 
the antigen antibody complex that causes inflammation. And these guys are also involved with helping against multicellular parasites, things like worms that we don't see very often. Basophils are the upregulators for inflammation. These guys cause inflammation because they release the two chemicals, histamine and heparin. Histamine is the vasodilator and heparin is an anticoagulant or it prevents blood clotting. And that's really what inflammation is, is increased blood flow. So basophils tend to increase it and eosinophils, once it starts to get too much, can start to control it and kind of downregulate it a little bit. Monocytes are our big eaters. These are the macrophages. These guys act like policemen and janitors. And so they clean up the cellular debris after something is destroyed in our body, but they also go after the bad guys, the pathogens, and they engulf these pathogens and they destroy them. Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes is something we're going to explore a little bit more in this chapter, so I'm going to go back. I want you to definitely make a note that lymphocytes, the two main lymphocytes, the T and the B cells, provide us with what we're going to call specific defenses. So our ability to defend off very specific problems, and we will talk about that here later in the chapter. So B cells, you need to know, make antibodies. T cells do cell-to-cell -cell combat. And natural killer cells or NK cells, these are not part of the specific defenses, but these are going to roam around the body. They're going to provide what's called immunological surveillance, and what they're going to do is look at all the cells. If you're an infected cell or if you're a cancerous cell, it's going to try to kill you because it doesn't want you in the body. You may infect other cells, and we don't need that. We don't want that. Now, I want you to know, and this slide, really the main thing, is telling us that most whites are not in the blood. Most white blood cells hang out where they live in their lymphatic system structure or maybe where they're performing their functions, right? So they don't really use the bloodstream all that much. These guys tend to be found in their immune structures. They use the bloodstream to get to where there's damage and then they start to fight that damage. Here you can kind of see the different blood cells, and here's some different tissues. Not that big of a deal. Let's talk about something else. So we have some cells involved with um, this response. We're also going to have a group of chemicals called cytokines. And I want you to know that a cytokine is not one chemical. It is a group of chemical messengers, right? These are usually paracrine factors, or these are usually local factors, local chemicals. They're made and they're used almost always in the same place. These cytokines are chemicals that help coordinate the immune response. Cytokines can do a lot of different things. It's just a, simply a group of chemical messengers, kind of like a hormone or a neurotransmitter, but instead of using the bloodstream, they tend to just stay within the cells that make, or the tissues that make them, so they tend to be local and paracrine. But here, specifically in the immune system, we're going to see a different cytokine here and there that helps to coordinate the immune response and make sure that the immune response is taking place normally. So again, they regulate, facilitate the immune system in its response. They communicate between cells. Again, they're types of messengers. Whenever they communicate, they control behavior of the cells that they're targeting, of their effector cells. So things like whenever we have a fever, there's a, a type of a cytokine that, a, that affects the hypothalamus to bump the thermostat up, and then our body starts to get warmer. Right, So they can be involved with inflammation, they can serve as weapons, they can influence other cells like the nervous system, like I just said, within, with a, a fever. So they have a lot of different functions. We're going to use this as a general term, cytokine. Every now and then we may talk about a specific one, but overall we're really talking about it in general. Now, there's two different forms of immunity, and this is basically the whole chapter in a nutshell. Innate versus adaptive. Now, I like to still call them a little bit old school terms. Innate immunity are also referred to as our non-specific defenses. So innate means that we're born with it. Non-specific means that it doesn't really care what you are. If you are a bad guy or if you are a cell that has been infected, then it's going to try to kill you. It doesn't care who you are. Okay. Now, adaptive immunity, on the other hand, adaptive immunity is what develops 
as we get exposed to new things in the environment, right? So we're not born with our adaptive immunity. As we encounter new things in the environment, we adapt to those new things. And this immunity is also called, and I'll tend to refer to it mainly as specific defenses. So adaptive immunity is also referred to as your specific defenses. Now the key with adaptive is it can create a specific solution to a very specific problem. And so that's kind of the key. That's why we kind of use that term specific defense, specific solution to a very specific problem. The specific problem is a new foreign antigen. So we find this new foreign antigen or our immune system finds the new foreign antigen in our body. And then the specific solution is an antibody. So the foreign antigen is the problem. That is the specific problem. And part of what our adaptive immunity, our specific defenses do that's very powerful is it creates an antibody that battles just that one antigen and kills, targets that cell, helps to destroy that cell. So adaptive immunity cares what you are, but it also has the ability to find something new and adapt to it. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's talk about the differences between the two. Here with innate or non-specific defenses, these guys are always active, right? That doesn't require a previous exposure. You are born with these defenses. So things like skin. Skin is always active and it's always preventing anything from entering the body. And so that's a good example of an innate defense, part of your innate immunity or a non-specific defense. It always responds the same way to any problem, right? And that's kind of the thing. Your skin doesn't care if it's a virus, a bacteria, or a protozoan. It's still just going to try to block you from block it from getting in. On the other hand, adaptive immunity or specific immunity, specific defenses, this always involves T cells and B cells, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. These are our specific defenders. Again, T cells are involved with cell to cell combat. They're going to come up, they're going to identify infected and abnormal cells, and they're going to physically kill them with some chemicals that they shoot at the bad guys. B cells, on the other hand, are the ones that sit back and they figure out the bad guy's code. They figure out what the foreign antigen is, and a B cell makes that antigen seeking missile, that antibody. And the antibody we put into the bloodstream, into a fluid, and there it's going to be able to bind to that antigen kind of like a, a, a some sort of hormone or some sort of you know neurotransmitter but it binds and here instead of causing a positive reaction within a cell it causes a negative reaction it's going to bind and it's going to destroy that cell now again these guys only show up after exposure. You must be exposed in order to adapt or to have your specific defenses. And this is the most powerful means of our immunity. This is our true immunity. If these two cells are not active, then we don't have our true immunity. So these two cells are super important. This takes a while for it to develop. So our skin is always active. It happens right now, right then, right? Once we get in, neutrophils are always there. But here, this adaptive immunity takes days to develop. And so it, usually what happens is the nonspecifics, the um, innate abilities are acting in the beginning and they're kind of doing damage control, trying to make sure that the problem doesn't get out of hand because while they're damage controlling and keeping things under control, the specific defenses are building themselves up and they're starting to get um, to the point where we've built enough antibodies that we can have a powerful response. Okay. Now, here's a way to look at it, kind of. We've got our innate immunities, we've got some, some membranes, some things that stop, and then we've got our internal defense. So we try to keep everything out to begin with. If things get in, we're gonna adapt, we're gonna try to throw some cells at them, some chemicals at them, and maybe some different responses. For adaptive immunity, we're gonna have our T cells doing what's called cell-mediated immunity, and that's also what I call cell-to-cell -cell combat, physically finding the bad guys and, and torturing them and killing them. And then here we have our B cells, our B lymphocytes that are involved with humoral immunity, which means fluid-based immunity. And this is, they're going to, um, once they find that foreign antigen, they're going to become a new cell called a plasma cell. And a plasma cell is what makes the antibodies. Let's talk about NHs first, and then we will continue with our 
um, more adaptive and more specific defenses. First off, innate, again, the whole, the first job is to try to stop it from getting in. If we can prevent it from coming in, we don't have to have any response at all. So the first line of defense is going to be our skin and then any other mu membranes like the mucous membranes that might have access to the outside. Once something gets in, then we're going to activate some cells, right? Some neutrophils, some macrophages, some NK cells. We're going to start releasing some chemicals to try to prevent these things. We're going to call them interferons and complement proteins. And then we may have a few processes like inflammation and fever that we're going to kick in to try to help with that response. So let's first talk about the first thing, which is preventing entry. So in order to prevent entry, obviously skin is a major player. The physical barrier of the skin helps to block most things from getting into our skin. We have our own bacteria on our skin that helps fight this battle for us as well. They help to fight the bad guys and help prevent the bad ones, the pathogenic MOs, from actually causing trouble. Again, besides that, we have mucous membranes. So mucus is a thick secretion that can help prevent an entry of a foreign particle of a bad pathogen. Also, some of the some of the accessories like hair, hair, you know, in the ear, in the nose, around the eyes, tries to prevent entry into the body as well. It's not really mentioned there. Um, again, usually this is successful. We don't get sick every day. Our skin's very, very functional, very successful. But if something gets past it, then we have to trigger our internal processes of the innate immunity. And at the same time, we begin the processes for our adaptive or our specific defenses. So if something gets in, we first throw the nonspecifics at it. And while the nonspecifics are fighting it, we're in the background getting our specific defenses prepared, trying to build this response. Again, if something gets in, we're going to see cells, we're going to see chemicals, and we're going to see a couple processes that can help out. So let's talk about cells first. Neutrophils and macrophages, one more time, these are our phagocytes. These are the two main phagocytes in the body. Neutrophils are the most common white blood cell, and these are the main microphage. These are microphages. And so these guys, they especially love to eat bacteria. These guys are the first to arrive on the scene if something gets inside of the body. So these are the first to show up and start that battle. Macrophages, on the other hand, these are the big eaters. These guys come in a little bit later. These guys tend to stay in a tissue and then they use the bloodstream as a monocyte and then they get into the um, tissue into other tissues if they want to. But these guys, again, macrophages act like policemen and janitor. They're going to go in, they're going to try to eat the bad guys, engulf the bad guys, or engulf unwanted, substance, unwanted substances, leftover stuff that needs to be digested and thrown away in the body so that it doesn't cause any future problems. Neutrophils eating a bacteria merges with its lysosome. The enzymes in the lysosome break it apart, and here he's just kind of pooping out the residue, right, just releasing that residue. Basophils, mast cells. If we have a blood cell that's causing inflammation in the bloodstream, we call it a basophil. If we have a cell in a tissue that's causing inflammation, we call it a mast cell. So they're kind of the same thing, right? They both cause inflammation. It's just the ones in the bloodstream, we refer to them as basophils, and the ones in the tissue, we call them mast cells. These guys release these two important chemicals, histamine and heparin. Histamine, again, is a vasodilator. Later. Histamine opens blood vessels and heparin prevents clots. It's an anticoagulant. The whole key here, inflammation increases blood flow. If we increase blood flow, we increase our ability to heal. And so that's truly what we're trying to do is get more blood so we can heal faster. So inflammation is a good thing. If inflammation gets out of control, then that's definitely a bad thing. Natural killer cells, this is our, our other type of cell that we're going to talk about. Natural killer cells focus on infected and abnormal cells. Infected mainly with virus and bacteria, and then abnormal cells like cancer, or maybe a cell that was transplanted that should not be there. Maybe they didn't get the transplant proper, right? They didn't get the transplant right. NK cells, I want you to know that they undergo, they perform what's called immune surveillance or immunological surveillance. 
These cells are always looking around the body, trying to detect these unhealthy cells, these infected and these abnormal cells. And so they're always surveying the body, and if they find a bad cell, they're just going to go ahead and destroy it, try to get rid of it. Now, these guys are basically nonspecific T cells. We're going to find out that our cytotoxic T cells, the T cells that actually do the cell to cell combat, these guys do the exact same thing. So T's and NK's, they act the same. NK's don't have to be triggered by a helper T cell. We're going to find this out later in the chapter. These NK's don't need a helper T to trigger them. These are natural killers and they just roam around and if you're different they're going to try to kill you they don't need permission okay and they don't have to have an exact understanding of who you are and that's a little bit more of what a t-cell does it needs permission and it has to know who you are a little bit better now how does a natural killer cell kill it has two chemicals perforins and enzyme granzymes perforins punch holes in bad guy these guys form pores in the membrane of the bad guy. Just like a bullet, if you put a pore, a big giant pore in your body, you're gonna bleed out. So if we put a bunch of pores in this thing, it's gonna bleed out. It's ooze, it's gonna ooze its guts out. Granzymes are something that we can put inside of the cell. And once we put these in the cell, granzymes trigger self-destruct. It triggers the cell to kill itself, which is its normal death is called apoptosis, so it triggers this cell to kill itself before it's ready to actually do it, okay? So it kind of just says, it's like an old Jedi mind trick, you want to kill yourself, and then the cell says, I want to kill myself, and it kills itself, okay? And then that way, it kind of gets rid of that infected or that cancerous cell. Here you can see perforins kind of making a pore, making a hole, and then here we can see the granzymes coming in, and that's going to lead to that cell's death. Eosinophils, again, these guys like to target multicellular parasites, not just parasites, but multicellular parasites, things that have more than one cell, like a worm. And also, they're involved with eating some of the antigen antibody complexes. What this does, the antigen antibody complex is what causes an immune response. So if you're having one of these when you're not supposed to, well, that's called an allergy, or it's caused by asthma, called asthma, right? And so, to control this process and to control even inflammation here, then these eosinophils are going to eat these complexes and stop that immune response. And so that's really what happens. They help to downregulate the immune response to make sure it doesn't go out of control. And that's the main thing. When it downregulates, it's not trying to do it for a bad reason. It's just trying to do it to help it to make sure it doesn't go out of control. Here's kind of showing you that eosinophil and a parasitic worm almost looks like something from Star Wars. We got the kind of Millennium Falcon there, and then we've got sending some some phaser torpedoes going to Star Trek, and then here we got this giant worm in space, right? So it kind of looks like that, um, but just imagine it on a microscopic level in our bloodstream, you know, or in a tissue. Now let's move on. Let's talk about some of these um, chemicals that can be used. The first chemical is called an interferon. And an interferon, it kind of does just what it says. It interferes with viral application. So it interferes with the process of how a virus does damage to a cell. A virus injects its DNA or its RNA. And right now we're seeing COVID and you're hearing people talk about RNA. And so it injects its RNA into a cell and this RNA can reverse apply itself and change the DNA. And when it changes the DNA, it adds the code to build more viruses. So then it turns your body's DNA on in those cells that have become infected and it starts to make even more viruses. Eventually the virus fills up that cell and the cell ruptures. It pops and it ruptures. And in this process, it releases more vitamins and then it can infect even more cells. If we can prevent a virus from replicating, from actually reproducing inside of a cell, then it won't rupture and it won't spread that virus. It won't spread that infection. And so the key here, these interferons, basically what they do is they interfere with viral replication. They prevent the virus from replicating, from making copies of itself. And in that process, we basically just 
stop the virus. That virus is more than welcome to live in one cell. As long as it doesn't spread anywhere else, then that virus is not causing us very much damage at all, very much repercussions at all. So here are these interferons, chemicals that attack these viruses and they prevent viruses from replicating. Our interferons are not working on COVID and that's the big thing. It takes a long time for this response to kick in and they're not quite as effective. COVID has adapted to a lot of our defenses and that's why it's such a powerful superbug. Okay, here we can kind of see some of that. I'm going to move on. Complement proteins or complement system. I prefer you call them complement proteins. This is a group of proteins and these proteins can do many different things to help assist this non-specific, this innate response. So it's a group of plasma proteins and these proteins can work together or they can work with antibodies and that's almost where we get the term complement. They can complement each other or they can complement what an antibody does. Now here we see four different things listed that they can perform. Let's just take a look at them. The first thing that a complement protein can do is referred to as opsonization. Opsonization is the process of sticking onto something that is too slippery and basically putting a handle onto something that's too slippery so it's easier for a phagocyte to eat. Some bacteria are coated on their outer membranes with sugar and just like when you put a Jolly Rancher in your mouth and it starts to get wet, it's going to slide around. And so if a phagocyte tries to grab a hold of this slippery bacteria, it may just slip right out of its mouth. But imagine if that phagocyte has some corn cob holders with it and it can just jam those corn cob holders into the side of that bacteria and now it's got a handle. It's got something to hang on to and it can pull it in and it can help it to eat that structure. So opsonization, here it talks about enhancing phagocytosis, right? It allows the phagocyte to eat more of the bad guy, which is a good thing, okay? Complement proteins, the second thing they can do is trigger inflammation. They can trigger the cells that cause inflammation. Okay, so complements can cause inflammation and then they can also attract our phagocytes to help kill the problem. And again, once they get there, most of the bacteria are going to have corn cob holders in them so they're easier to eat, right? Just because they're hot and slippery, now they're easier to eat. They're not really hot, but they're slippery, right? Cytolysis or cytolysis, what they can do, uh, sometimes I like for you to add the term MAC here, big letters M-A-C, and those stand for membrane attack complex. The membrane attack complex acts just like perforin. So just like in the NK cells and what we're going to see in the T cells, perforin acts like bullets. Here, some of these, um, these complement proteins can act like bullets and they can punch holes in a bad guy, right? So just like if we punched holes in you, fluid is going to leak out and that's going to cause its lysis, its destruction. Another thing, it's similar to what we were talking about um, dealing with the uh, eosinophils that it, it can eliminate immune complexes, antigen antibody complexes. So this can be involved with eliminating these and helping to um, kind of control a response. I'm not really going to get into much detail with that, but just know that that is a function. Here we can see an image in the textbook, figure 22.5, that kind of demonstrates all of these functions. Now let's look at the processes. We've got two basic processes that are involved with um, this defense. And at that point, once I finish these processes, I'll probably, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording because I want to put this in a separate recording and allow you to go straight to the discussion about specific defenses with the second recording for this chapter. And that way, this, this information is fairly easy, straightforward, the non-specific defenses, the innate immunities. But once we get to the specifics, it's a little bit more complicated. And so I want to chop this chapter up so it's easier for you to digest and you can go straight to the complicated stuff if you want to rewatch anything over and over again. Now again, let's get back into these nonspecifics and start to finish them up. First off, we have finished talking about the cells and we finished talking about the chemicals involved in these processes. Now let's talk, or in the nonspecific defenses, now let's talk about two processes in the nonspecific defenses. The first process is inflammation. 
we've already been discussing this a little bit. Inflammation is due to histamine and heparin, right? So we know that inflammation is basically due to histamine and heparin. And what inflammation is, is increased blood flow to a region especially a small confined area. So we like to call lo we like to call it local, a local blood flow or blood flow to a local area, right? And so this inflammation, it should be confined in a small area. It's increased blood flow. And as we mentioned, increased blood flow means increased healing, right? We can get the bad guys out of the body faster. So we can eliminate most infectious agents from the body this way through inflammation. And so as a result, we tend to see inflammation with most types of responses that pop up dealing with any of these infectious agents. Here's an example. We can see some bacteria that's gotten into this cut. This little kid's skateboarding. Unfortunately, the cut is allowing this bacteria in, and now we're going to start to have this response. The bacteria is going to start to trigger some of these cells, start to trigger the basophils and some of the mast cells to start making their histamine and heparin. This is going to open the blood vessels up more, and this is going to send more blood to that region. And now, as a result, when we're sending more blood to that region, we're healing a lot faster. Okay, you don't have to know all those steps. I'm not that in, in, interested in that. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to get some whites coming in, and these whites, we're going to get our, you know, if this is a fire, we're going to get a bunch of firemen and the fire trucks coming in. So we're going to get a lot of these white blood cells coming in to help with this process. Um, and eventually, we're going to start to lead to this tissue repair. Some of the signs of inflammation, redness, because there's increased blood flow. Heat, it's warmer because there's increased blood flow, right? Because blood's warmer than the rest of your body. Swelling, because there's increased blood flow, right? You get, you're starting to see a pattern here. Swelling, because there's increased blood flow, right, in that region. Pain, because there's increased blood flow. They're swelling and we're pushing on nerves, and so that's going to create pain. And if we keep pushing on a nerve, that could lead to loss of function even, right? So inflammation could eventually lead to a loss of function, and that could be a very bad thing. Think about meningitis, an infection dealing with the meninges and these layers that surround the brain. So if we start to compress the brain and the brain goes to sleep, kind of like your foot goes to sleep when you sit on your leg, then that's a bad thing. Brain going to sleep leads to death. The next process is fever. Of course, fever is an increase in body temperature. Usually we say at least one degree Celsius. And so usually what we say is anywhere over 100, 100.4, that's whenever we're starting to see a fever, right? Now this is due to some chemicals that are released in the body called pyrogens, endogenous pyrogens. They're born within our body and these generate fire, pyrogen, right? So fire generators. What these what these do, I want you to know, these pyrogens target the hypothalamus, and our hypothalamus is our thermostat. We talked about that last semester in 210 in the brain, but if you've forgotten, make sure that you remember that. Hypothalamus is thermostat. The pyrogens bump the thermostat up, and now we're starting to get warmer. Okay, so we bump it from 98.6 up to 100.4, and boom, now we start to get our fever. The key is increased temperature in our body makes our defenses better and it makes the bad guys defenses worse so if we increase our body temp we get better at defending the body and the bacteria and the viruses and the things that are attacking us they get weaker at attacking our body so if we get a metabolic bump and they get a metabolic drop then now we've definitely got the advantage so fever definitely provides an advantage. It inhibits the reproduction of these bacteria and viruses. It promotes a lot of the interferon. It promotes our immunity, accelerates tissue repair. So that's something I definitely want you to make a note about, that not only does it accelerate tissue repair, but it also makes us want to sleep. Fever makes us want to go sleep. Sleeping accelerates repair. When we're asleep, we heal four times faster than if we are awake. So we need to sleep about a quarter of our day at a minimum in order to maintain our body, right? And that's kind of what we do. We sleep six to eight hours, and that's about a quarter of the day, right? If you get less than six, five or six hours, then you're hitting sleep deprivation, and your body's not maintaining itself well. Fever causes sleep, and sleep increases repair. 
Okay, low fever, leave it untreated. No need to worry about a low fever. High fever, we got some serious issues. Okay, fever in the 103s or higher is when we're really talking about a high fever. And so once we start to get up towards the 106 and 109, we start to see serious neurological issues. So we especially start to see seizures at the lower temperature. We start to see irreversible brain damage up to 106. And then we start to see complete destruction of neural tissue and, and it stops working at 109. So death is likely there, 108, 109. Definitely not a good thing. Okay, here's a little snot-nosed baby, kind of showing you all of our different defenses. Here's that first line, trying to keep everything out. And then once it gets in, here's kind of what's happening. We got cells, we got chemicals, we got processes that take place. At that point, that takes us into the adaptive immunity. And like I said, adaptive immunity, we're going to cover in another presentation. So I want to put all the adaptive immunity into a separate presentation and at that point we're kind of finished discussing what's happening here with um, the innate defenses and the non-specific defenses and before we finish this up I want to cover some stuff that's actually at the end of the chapter so after we cover the adaptive immunity or the specific defenses I'm going to cover this in this presentation so that we don't have to cover it after we cover that next information because that next information again specific defenses is not that easy here let's talk about the different forms of immunity. Okay, so real quick, the different forms of immunity. There's a nice little image in your textbook that kind of talks about this. Overall, there are two forms of immunity. There is active immunity and there is passive immunity. Okay, so I want you to know that. First off, active immunity. You are exposed to a foreign antigen. So you're exposed to the pathogen or the foreign antigen and you make your own antibodies. So in an active immunity, you're exposed to the antigen and you make your own antibodies, kind of like what we talked about back in the day with blood cell typing, right? So we're going to have the antibodies to destroy the foreign antigen. So if you're ever exposed to the foreign antigen in an active situation, you create your own antibodies. In a passive situation, you're not exposed to the antigen, but instead you're simply given antibodies, right? So this could, there's some good ways and there's some, you know, kind of suspect ways of getting these antibodies. But overall, we get some from mama through breast milk and through the placenta. And then um, there's a possibility the doctor could give, could administer some, for example, like antivenom. So let's talk about that. Active immunity, again, is whenever we encounter the pathogen, we encounter the foreign antigen, and we have our own response. This is kind of what we want to do. There's two forms of an active immunity. There's a naturally active, and there's an artificially, or there's an induced active. Naturally active means that you encountered this foreign antigen just in nature, just in day-to-day -day moving around, and you ran into this, right? This is what's happening right now, for example, with this COVID-19 virus, is that you catch it through naturally active immunity. That's how we usually catch everything, right? Our body's really good at seeing these things and learning how to defend against them and not forgetting it. With COVID, we're not really able to fight it. It's got some mechanisms that are preventing our immune system from doing what it normally does, right? And so as a result, it's kind of lessening our immune system's ability to fight this disorder. So naturally active is usually how we see it. You're just exposed to the antigen in nature. Artificially or induced means that it is forced on you. So the antigen is forced on you. Usually this is done in the process of a vaccine or an immunization. So a vaccine or an immunization, what that does is it takes a dead version of the virus. And a lot of people are like, oh, that virus came back alive and started to hurt me. No, it didn't. You're having an immune response because of the dead virus, not the active virus. It's just some people don't choose to learn and they just want to repeat just kind of silliness instead of actually knowing facts, you know. So the key in these vaccines and in these, in these immunizations, we're getting a dead version. Many times we're even killing that 
that cell completely and chopping it up. All that we need are its antigens, just those markers on its cell surface. So those are in that vaccine, in that immunization, they're injected into you, and then your body has a response, right? Your body is going to have a primary response due to the vaccine. It's not going to actually get sick, but you're going to have a response like you may be exposed and getting sick, right? So you're not actually going to get sick. That's impossible through a vaccine, right? That just doesn't make sense. And so here, um, this vaccine, it's going to cause a primary response. That way, if you ever see this disorder again, the flu vaccine, you get a flu shot. It's for those types of flus that are most common that year. So there's not one flu. Make sure you understand that. Right now we hear a lot of misinformation and stupid people talking about stuff on Facebook. So don't, don't listen to idiots, right? But the whole key is you're going to get a dead or an inactive version. And again, these flu viruses change each year. So you're going to get that year's versions what's more prominent that year, and they're going to inject it into you. Then you're going to have a response. You're going to build up your antibodies, and in that process, you're going to retain those antibodies. So if you ever see that problem again, you've already got the antibodies to fight it off. You're not actually going to get sick as bad from the flu. You're going to be able to fight it like you already have been fighting it for a week or so. Okay. Now, the other is passive immunity. And again, passive, we can have naturally passive or we can have artificially or induced passive. Naturally passive, again, passive meant that you were just given antibodies. Naturally passive is where you get them from mama, right? So breast milk or through the placenta is how naturally passive immunity can be passed. These antibodies can just be given to you. Or artificially passive. Again, here, this is some sort of injection, some sort of medicine that a doctor would give you. The best example for this would be antivenom, right? So antibodies to snake venom, and we call that antivenom. So you don't naturally have these antibodies in your body, but if you get bit by a poisonous snake, then you can get these antibodies injected into you, and there they will try to defend against that venom. Now, most of the time, your antivenom is extremely expensive and it's hard to come by. And so most of the time they're going to use other medicines to fight you. But in an extreme situation, they may try to use that antivenom. Again, this is not a real response, right? You're simply given these antibodies. You're not actually producing a response. You're not making memory cells and your body's not memorizing this response. So again, vaccines, weakened or dead microorganisms, so they're not able to reproduce. All it's doing is stimulating a response from our B cells. Then the B cells make these antibodies. We store some of our memory cells, and then that way the next time we see it, we may have lifelong immunity, or we may need a little booster shot. But the next time we see it, then we're going to be able to defend it without ever actually seeing it in nature. An allergy is a hypersensitivity of the immune system. So an allergy, again, it's a hypersensitivity. In other words, you're having an immune response when you're not supposed to, right? So you're not supposed to be having an immune response. You know, the normal person wouldn't possibly, but you are allergic to various things. Everybody is. And so it triggers these hypersensitivities, these overreactions of the immune system. Whatever triggers that is called an allergen. And we've kind of mentioned it, the most extreme form is anaphylaxis. An anaphylactic shock kicks in, and that can kill somebody. Last thing that we're going to mention here is HIV and AIDS. And I kind of alluded to this just a second ago. If we don't have active T cells and active B cells, then we don't have a true immune response. And what HIV and AIDS does is it destroys, it targets the helper T cells. And helper T cells are what activate the other Ts and the B cells to produce our, <clears throat> our true immune responses. <coughs> so sorry about that cough. And so... If you have this virus, and again, it's a type of virus, kind of like COVID, right? And so this virus really lessens our immune system's ability to fight off other things. And COVID does a little bit of this. It lessens our, our abilities to fight that COVID itself and also other things. And so then uh, people are going to die, not necessarily from COVID, but from something else that is no longer functioning properly. And this has been a, so, a point of confusion with a lot of people there on the internet. A lot of stupid people are posting things like, well, people aren't dying of COVID. They're dying of, you know, another problem, right? A 
pre-existing condition. Well, that's just about ignorant, right? COVID doesn't kill you directly. It affects your organs, and then those organs stop working. So, of course, they can't just put COVID on a death certificate. They have to put what did COVID actually act on. And so now you got these morons on, on the Internet who think that they're geniuses because they see this. They see, oh, well, it says COVID, but it also says, you know, lung failure right? Or liver failure, something like that. And so these people are saying, well, they didn't die of COVID. They died of liver failure. Well, their liver would not have failed if it wasn't for COVID affecting their immune system and not allowing them to fight that problem off quite as well, right? And so there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of people who choose not to learn and not be intelligent. And so make sure that you're educating yourself and understanding this, especially if you're going to discuss it and talk about it with friends and have an opinion on it so strong you want to put it on Facebook, for example, you know? So you got to be very careful with this information and make sure that you treat it scientifically and not emotionally. And that's the problem is that people tend to not think with their brain. They tend to think with their emotions nowadays. And we kind of see that. But again, HIV and AIDS, definitely a terrible disorder. It targets those helper T cells. It doesn't allow our immune system to function properly. And then you're most likely going to die of a cancerous situation or of some sort of pneumonia. Okay. So I hate to leave on that note. It's not really a high note, you know, but I hate to leave on that note. But here we're finished with this half of the chapter. Again, um, look for the second half of the chapter that covers the specific defenses and it does it all by itself, and that tends to be the hardest part of the chapter, so you can rewatch that individually. All right, I hope that you have a wonderful day, and if you need any help, please contact me. Thanks a lot.